Hello, everyone. Bobby Lee Bitcoin here. Welcome to the first episode of my new podcast, Bobby Lee Bitcoin Podcast. And today we have our guest. We have Dusty Trevino, CEO of Dot Vegas TLD. Yeah, thanks. So everyone, say hi to Dusty. And hello, everybody, and thanks, Bobby, for having me. I appreciate this yes. opportunity. So, Dusty, you're the CEO of Dot Vegas TLD. We talked about this before the podcast started. Uh, what does TLD mean uh, for for everyone in our audience? Yeah, what is a TLD? Yeah, great question because a lot of, not a lot of people know that acronym. It actually stands for top level domain. So it's that part of the domain name at, to the right of the dot, just like a dot com. Yes, com is the TLD, and so we own and operate the dot Vegas TLD. Yeah. So for many people uh, on the internet, we know about the dot com address and the dot net. Yeah. So these are all website URLs, for example, that have a suffix dot com, and that's a TLD. And then you, your company runs the the registrar for the dot Vegas. Correct. And how did that come about? Yeah, so that's a good question too. It, it kind of goes way back, right? Where um, we used to be involved with uh, country code dot CC, which is a country code for the Cocos Keeling Islands. And so we kind of knew the space and, and then there's a group that oversees the entire internet and they're called ICANN. It's the International Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers. That's right. And so about six, seven years ago, they opened up the spectrum because they wanted competition for .com and they allowed groups to apply for any domain extension that they wanted to. And so because we knew the space, we knew ICANN, we applied for the dot .vegas because uh, we recognized two geographic ones were fairly important. Yeah. And so we applied to ICANN for the dot .vegas and they awarded us the delegation. And so we were fortunate enough now to be running that. I and, see. And we've got a good partnership, which kind of we run a private uh, public partnership with the city on that, obviously. Oh, with the Las Vegas city? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Because it is considered a city designation, designated. Yes. TLD. And there's probably no other cities out there or countries out there with with Vegas as a as a, as a part of their name, right? Correct. We're the only one. So that's, yeah, that's, that's great. Nice. And, and there's only four U.S. cities that have them. Us, New York. Boston and Miami. That's it. I see. And um, was it tough getting the getting winning the dot Vegas? It, it was right because we had to not only win it at the local level um, and get the city's endorsement, but then at the ICANN level as well. The application process was quite extensive. Uh, you had to prove, obviously, you had the technical background, you had the financial background, and all that kind of stuff to run these because it's yes. a big undertaking. Once you're embedded in the root system of the internet. Like it's there forever, forever, right? forever. Yes. So forever. they, they want to make sure that they hand it off to a competent group to run it, right? Yeah. So it, yeah, it was quite a bit of process. So before I ask you about your background, you know, in technology or finance, but quickly, um, do you own any dot Vegas domains yourself? I do. Yeah. Occasionally, what do you have? I you got, have Dusty dot Vegas. Uh, yeah. You know, so the usual get get my names, get my name, my my wife's name, my daughter's name in it. Yeah. Um, I own a few areas that I like, um, like personal. My, my wife's a personal trainer, so we have personal training dot Vegas. Got you know, it. Some very nice kind of keyword term uh, just in the, the dot Vegas that I like. That's great. So maybe we should get a Bitcoin dot Vegas. Yeah, I should. I, th- I think that sold. That went really quick. That oh, went, it sold. Yeah, that, okay. that went like with the day we launched. Those those kind of names went pretty quick. I see. So. I see. Good. Good. So tell us about your background. Y- yeah. So you my, told, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, my, my background actually though is finance. Uh, that's always been my undergraduate and graduate degrees are in, in, in finance, capital markets, and corporate finance. Um, and it was kind of through that that led me into the technology space that I am today. But again, my, that's my background, and and really that's why you know again, and I appreciate you having me on the podcast today. And I am fascinated with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general is yes. because my background is finance. I'm always curious of what's going on in the evolution that you see in finance. And this was a obviously a revolutionary change in finance that we saw with these cryptocurrencies now and specifically Bitcoin. Yes, so, yes. So that's what kind of really led me to it. And, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to kind of get exposed to it back in 2010 or so in the early, early days. With, in what? In with Bitcoin. Oh, in 2010? Yeah. Oh, that's super early. Yeah, but I wasn't smart enough to buy it. I was just <laughs> cutting my teeth and trying to learn about it, right, yeah, kind yeah. of thing. But, uh, what, but What was your first uh, memory of exposure to Bitcoin? Um, so so one of my friends, actually, uh, old business partner, he was really big into it. And so he'd actually gifted me a bunch to try to understand the technology. Okay, okay. And that, that so that was my first thing is, you know, downloading a, a wallet on my computer, right? Yeah. Back then, you really didn't have an exchange. Like That's a right. Base or it was, like it was probably the Bitcoin program itself. Probably. Were you right. running a Windows computer or a Mac computer? It was a Windows computer. So it was like the Bitcoin, they call it Bitcoin QT or Bitcoin yeah, Core, I, one of those Bitcoin programs. Yeah, and the then, original. Yeah. And then I almost made the mistake of donating my laptop with, uh, with that wallet still on it in 10, 10, 10 Bitcoins. You, in, you t- made the mistake, you donated it? No, I almost did. You almost did. I so almost you, did. you didn't give it away. No, I didn't. I, I went to my closet and I was like, you know what? I think I put 
that wallet on this computer and I need to check? Because again, it was the early days and, I, and I didn't really understand. So it really was 2010. Yeah, it was. 2000. Wow, that's way early. That's even earlier than when I got in. Yeah, it was, it, I mean, it was back when it was like a buck or two bucks, right? And, yeah, then, yeah. and then I got caught up in the Mount Gox stuff a little bit too. And yeah. not, not to digress, but because at that point, that was the only exchange you could go to too was Mount Gox. Right? That's if right. You did that's right. Kind of activity. Um, but no, so fortunately, I was fortunate that I was able to get them off that yep. and again. And so, and that was, again, my friend trying to help me understand the space and kind of cut my teeth on really what yeah. it was. And it, you pulled out the wallet.dat file, the yeah. fi infamous uh, wallet file yep. from yeah, the computer. Did, did all that kind of stuff. And, and it, but it's because it, it's such a, I don't know, it's such an interesting asset class. It's so hard for most people to understand, even for people, you know, that are, have been in it for 10 years or so. It's, it's, it, but it's, that's right. But it is crazy. It's, it's amazing. So, yeah. So uh, you're bona fide Bitcoin uh, OG, right? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't go that far. I'm not. <laughs> I'm sitting uh, next to that the person right uh, here. Like I said, I've I am fortunate enough to you know say that I got I've known it since then, but not by so, no means. Yeah. I. So would you like to tell me what happened to the to that ten Bitcoin that you got? As it must have been just a fraction of dollars or or just a few dollars, right? Someone sending you ten dollars or ten Bitcoins, rather. Exactly at that point, right? And so I mean, I kept them, right? Again, I lost a few in the Mount Gox situation. Oh, so you moved some over to Mount Gox? Yeah, because I. Because when Bitcoin, and this was probably, geez, towards the ten, le, end of... Mt. closed down in 2014. Yeah, so it was towards, a, it was probably around 11 or so. It was when Bitcoin was hitting $1,000. Yeah, I started, 2013. Okay, was, so yeah. yeah, so I'd started moving some to Mt. Gox to, yeah. to sell. Yes. And I'd sold one, um, and, but that's right when it imploded. So I never got that money. And you then, didn't get the $1,000. No, and, okay. and, and, they, and then I had three other coins there that they ended up, uh, it's tied up in bankruptcy right now. I see. Although they just did approve that. So I'm hoping, That's not, right. knock on wood here, That's right. maybe in the next month I'll get so it. So those action. are the perils and dangers of storing your coins on an exchange. Exactly. You have right. to, it's a risk, right? Absolutely. If you're trying to sell it, you have to move to an exchange. And yet, if it goes bankrupt, if it goes wrong at the time, then you get caught yep. in that loop. In it, that, yeah, exactly. That's one of the numerous kind of risks, right? That it, that that is a learning process for everybody as you get into this, right? The different risks of kind of storage, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff, right? And so, but I was able to, I was fortunate enough to keep the rest of them, and then I did liquidate those through Coinbase um, back at the first go around when it, like the first peak, you know, when it went up through the roof. So, I was what, what's what in your mind? What was the first peak? Uh, Eighteen thousand. Eighteen thousand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That for was, some people, that's what that was like the third peak. Okay. Yeah. So right. right. <laughs> <laughs> for for me, that was yeah. that, that was, that was kind the of first the, uh, big run up. That, for that, you. that was okay. the first big up run. It was that so you eight. sold sold some bitcoins at eighteen thousand yeah, dollars. Yeah. Amazing. Around there, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was uh, probably December, November, December of two thousand seventeen. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Sounds about right. Yep. Good. Good. Yeah. And then you, Mount Gox, the the trustees there have been in contact with you regarding your your claim to yep. your few bitcoins. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because they've yeah. they've now it's been approved. The creditor um, yeah. uh, has been approved. And uh, I, I believe they're supposed to start re -re releasing payments here in the next month yeah. or two months, but it's still hard to get information out of them. They yeah, let me just for to explain to our audience who may not be familiar. So Monkox, MTGOX, uh, was the very first, uh, was one, yeah, one of the, actually the, technically the second uh, exchange in the world. And it was created uh, later on run by a gentleman named Mark Carpellis. Uh, I've talked about it in my book, The Promise of Bitcoin here. And uh, unfortunately in, January, February 2014, due to some prior hacks, they announced uh, their bankruptcy and being insolvent. So that's when all their users and depositors of Bitcoins and whatever money they had on this exchange were all locked up and frozen up and uh, they couldn't pay out their customers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people like yourself, Dusty, uh, had their assets sort of you know, taken away, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, thankfully, they, they did have some Bitcoin with them Mm -hmm. uh, they found it years later, and because of the huge increase in price, they think they're going to be able to pay back some of the creditors, all the users, uh, some fractional amount of what they what they put in. But it'll be probably you know in dollar terms, people might make their money back, but in Bitcoin terms, it'll uh, it may not happen. Yeah, it looks yeah. like it's going to be about fifteen percent, you know, fifteen, 15 cents, cents on a dollar. dollar, roughly, okay. right? Of of in Bitcoin terms, right? Got it. But got you're it. Right. That's still pretty good. Yeah, still not bad. Still, right? still better than people were thinking. You know, well, yeah. zero or just a penny or two on a dollar. Exactly right. So it still yeah. it still won't be a bad deal if that does happen, right? But yeah. yeah. It's so. just dragged on for a long, long time. Yeah, a very long time, very long time. Yeah. So, so, so Dusty, so that, that that was your first early episode of, in yeah. Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And have you been have you been um, keeping updated with Bitcoin and so on? I know you sold some coins in 2017. Yeah. How about in the last you know four or five years? What have you 
What have you seen? What have you been following along? Yeah. So I, again, I again I, I'm fascinated by the space, so I kind of follow it. I did dip my toes back in, kind of when let's call it, you know, kind of the crypto winter hat after that, right? Yes. Bitcoin went down to three thousand, roughly, I think, and maybe even lower. But yeah. Um. And so I started kind of dipping my toes back in it again. Um. Then, and then when this this most recent call it the for me the next spike right back up to forty five sixty five thousand. Yeah. So, it went to sixty nine thousand in November yeah, of two thousand twenty one. Yeah. So then it kind of you know again kind of started getting back out again. So pretty much at this point completely out. And as well as like in you know again that's what's so great to be able to talk to you is I mean this the the ecosystems with these are changing so rapidly. The technology from the new coins popping up, stuff like that. It has been difficult to, it's really difficult to kind of keep on top of, right? Yes. And so, like I said, with all that too, it's, you kind of have these, the really good ones like a Bitcoin, right? Where it, you kind of just, it's a stall heart and it's there. And because the other ones, again, the technology, the evolution of it is so, so crazy right now. So. Yeah, yeah. What What are your thoughts? What, uh, are you like, you know, what's your view on Bitcoin versus Ethereum versus the other coins? Well, actually, I'd like to kind of flip that and ask you, right? Because, yeah. I mean, again, I mean, my again, my my opinion is, or my thought is, it, 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 I'm not able to always keep up with things. And, sure, sure. And that, that was kind of one of my questions I wanted to ask you was, Please. right, when you first saw Bitcoin come out, right, the narrative around it, let's call it, was more of, look, this is a great way to, to do transactions, microtransactions, and yeah. for a fraction of cost as you could from a wire or something like that, right? <laughs> And it seems like we've seen that change. That narrative has kind of changed over the over as as Bitcoin's developed, and now it doesn't feel like we see it as much as a medium of exchange, but more of a store of value, a digital gold. Yes. Call it. So that's what I want to actually ask you: is kind of what's your thought, how it fits into the financial ecosystem today? Sure. And and really, what you might see, what you see it might become in five or ten years from now, if it's going to stay the same or if it's going to continue to evolve a little bit. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so the industry actually has different viewpoints on this, and I'm happy to share my viewpoint. So I'm very much pro Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've been in Bitcoin since 2011, started mining it, and then started the exchange in China called BTC China, the very first Bitcoin exchange. So I ran that as co-founder and CEO for five years from 2013 and on. And... So people, I guess one of the labels people put on is a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm a Bitcoin maximalist, if you will. Yeah. Uh, some people think that's a bad thing. Some people think that's a good thing. But regardless, I am very much pro Bitcoin. And for that reason, I, I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of all the other thousands and tens of thousands of other what those call uh, the altcoins and sometimes call shit coins, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so regarding Bitcoin, yes, the narrative has changed. If you recall in 2008 when the white paper was first released in October, you know, October 31st, Halloween of 2008, uh, Bitcoin was described as a cash, um, electronic peer-to-peer uh, -peer cash sort of uh, uh, for, for the internet. The idea was you could make payments peer-to-peer -peer electronically on the internet. Um, so we also know you know, for for money, the the English definition of, mo of the word money has three components: um, medium of exchange, uh, unit of uh, what do you call it, unit pricing, I guess, and then also store of value. Okay. Uh, the idea is that money has to have value; it has to be has be usable, tradable, and that's what makes it money. And Bitcoin was meant to be money. So Bitcoin was not only the first cryptocurrency, but it turns out now that there's thousands out there, every other crypto has a purpose. It's backed by a project, backed by some philosophy, backed by some um, some uh, business model, if you will. Some are asset backed, uh, some are stablecoin backed, and so on and so forth. But Bitcoin is the only one that's really what we call money, monetary good. Uh, so Fidelity recently published a good, really good research paper about Bitcoin. They re they really understood it, that Bitcoin is is a monetary good, and that's why for for my book, The Promise of Bitcoin, um, I call it the future of the future of money. Right, Bitcoin is the future of money, and it has those features, and that's why I'm such a big fan of it. So you're absolutely right that over the, over the last few years, it's changed. These days, um, in you know in the early days, I don't know if you participated, but people were using Bitcoin to buy. Drugs and stuff like yeah, that on man. Silk Road. Yep. Uh, I've heard horror stories where people, you know, not horror stories, but it, basically they, they bought thousands of Bitcoin or even tens of thousands to go buy all the stuff they can buy on Silk Road. Yeah. 
and only to find out later that their Bitcoin wallet was was net balance of zero because they spent it all. Okay. If only they had kept a few hundred, a few yeah. thousand, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so in any case, so today, Bitcoin. You know, I know um, you, you you know El Salvador. You know, legalizing Bitcoin. Yep. And then new country in Africa did that, Central African Republic. Okay. So they did that. Um, the issue is that Bitcoin today in, in regular physical society, not many stores, not many places accept Bitcoin yet. However, Bitcoin still has a large value, right? Today, you know, it's it's over $30,000. At one point, it was $69,000. So I'm a big believer in Bitcoin being a, store value okay. of a, beacon, a monetary asset, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what about you? Yeah. I mean, again, I think I, I like that narrative as well. I like the idea of it being a, again, a digital gold or whatever, right? Yeah. Where it's, you have a finite amount that can be produced 21 million, let's call it roughly. Right. That's right. And, um, and like I said, yeah, cause it doesn't seem in, in that form, a good means of actually doing transactions rapidly or whatever like that. But I like the idea that that people see it now as a store of value yes. and that it is limited supply. And that's what, I mean, again, I, I, I like it and um, I, it's going to always going to be on my radar and always look for opportunities to get into it. Right. And, and, and eventually, you know, hopefully just sit on it for long term and pass it on to my daughter when she's, you know, 20, 30 years from now kind of thing. Right. And, and have a nice balance. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, anyway, exactly. Right? So. Now, now for, for Bitcoin, you know, in terms of spending and making payments and stuff like that, I want to point out to the audience that it may not be convenient to use Bitcoin to make a small dollar purchase just okay. because of overhead and the time involved in all that. So if you want to buy coffee, it's probably not as practical to pay in Bitcoin, even though countries like El Salvador, they make it possible, right? Taxis or McDonald's or, or Starbucks coffee. However, for large payments, for international payments across uh, borders and maybe even during evenings and weekends across time zones, Bitcoin is very much feasible. Okay. Right, so that's where people actually do make payments uh, in Bitcoin for large amounts because because overhead and the time constraints favor Bitcoin, especially when the cross border, the banking system, you know, if you if you're doing cross borders, cross time zones, it's almost sure that when you want to pay, either your bank is closed or the receiving's bank is closed. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so you have to wait for the next day for the, for the money to arrive at the earliest, if not two or three days later. No, so this is where Bitcoin is instantaneous, regardless of what time zone, what uh, what countries you're in. No, and you're right. That's that's a good, great point too, right? Yeah. So I think I think that's probably where it's settling in terms of Bitcoin okay. as a um, store value, as international payment for for moderate or large amounts. Do yeah. you, do you, do you feel like that narrative? And I, I don't want to use that in a negative way. Don't please don't take that as I'm saying as a negative way because yeah. again, I think you, everything has to have a narrative. Everything has to have a story, right? And and how it's positioned. Do you think that's going to be the way it's going to maintain five or ten years from now, or do you see anything I, technology that can that can evolve with Bitcoin that it could maybe change a little bit? Yeah. So so there's a you may be aware there's a group of people out there uh, pushing for Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin yeah. Cash is a different branch of Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, their big sort of argument is they want Bitcoin to be usable as payments, as regular day-to-day -day payments. Okay. And, um, you know, they, and to, to accomplish that, they have a different technical, um, the, the Bitcoin Cash sort of uh, fork, if you will, has a different technology behind it. It uses, uh, it has larger blocks, allows for larger capacity, but the market, you know, this the fork, the big, big uh, Bitcoin forked off in you know late 2017, and what's happened is in the last four and a half years, the market has chosen the original Bitcoin BTC, mm -hmm. and that's what's giving it thirty thousand dollars in value, whereas the Bitcoin Cash is is down to one percent of its original yep. value, if you will. Yep. So for that reason, the market's sort of chosen one side, but the other side is still humming along, if you will. And people can do that, but but my my take is if you want to make small payments, there's a lot of layer two solutions, other solutions to maybe even centralized custodial solutions to make the layer two work, okay. right? So the most famous is the Lightning Lightning Network, allowing for fast you know micro transactions of Bitcoin. Uh, it's not settled on chain right away, but you can settle it you know whenever you want to. Okay, can you can you kind of explain a little bit what you mean by layer two though? Then so la layer so as you know. People may know this. Uh, Bitcoin, the underlying technology is blockchain. Okay. And this is the original Bitcoin blockchain. So the blockchain is a data structure. It's a decentralized public data structure that stores 
all the accumulated transactions of Bitcoin. So when I make a payment to you, um, what makes it true and uh, accurate? What makes it what makes it paid is that we see the record being compiled onto the Bitcoin blockchain. Okay. So let's say I were to send you some Bitcoin, I would have to have the private keys to my Bitcoins, sign a message using cryptography to say I've sent you, let's say, a fraction of a Bitcoin to your address. And then as a recipient, you don't need to do anything. You just need to provide the address, right? And then once the blockchain confirms my transaction, then it's permanently embedded in this ever-growing blockchain for Bitcoin. That's layer one. Okay. So layer one, and that's the core layer technology. And that's what they say, you know, it's irreversible. It's, uh, there's no, um, no, uh, no censoring. Right. And, and, uh, it's very decentralized. So no one can, no one can shut it down. You know, all it takes is a few people to run it. Layer one. Layer two is technology built on top of that. So for example, uh, lightning, lightning will be layer two. And then there'll be other, other solutions, uh, other side chains. So these are, these are other companies creating solutions that are sort of industry standards, but they're not as robust as layer one. So these are layer two solutions like Lightning. Uh, these allow for faster payments. They settle on a second layer, secondary ecosystem of okay. data. And then once in a while, it gets flushed out to the layer one. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, it gets very technical. Yeah, it gets yeah, very right. technical. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the summary is is it'll, take, it'll still take years to sort that out to make it commonplace. Yes. But however, the core layer one Bitcoin is solid. It's here been running for over 13 years. Uh, no downtime whatsoever. Okay. So, so that's what's important about Bitcoin. Yeah, and that's what actually. Because I kind of want to wrap back to one of the things you said earlier, and kind of what you're talking about right now is, you do see these articles from time to time, and I, I, I want to say it's probably by uninformed journalists or whatever they talk about Bitcoin getting hacked. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and, and I think a lot of it's probably just clickbait kind of stuff too. Because like, correct. Because what you're just saying, right? It, it's impossible to actually hack Bitcoin or to do any of that. Yes. It's more of somebody getting their. Uh, their account hacked at Coinbase yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Because again, the structure, technology structure of the of the blockchain with Bitcoin, that is unhackable. Is that correct? Or? Well, let me let me speak of this way. So, so you're absolutely right. There's a lot of stories over the years about Bitcoin being hacked, Bitcoin yeah. being banned, and all the okay. all the stuff like that. In most cases, the headlines are, descri are describing the wrong thing. They've okay. unfortunately clickbait and stuff like that. They haven't described it properly. So, Bitcoin itself. Again, uh, goes back to crypto uh, cryptography, which is yeah. a branch of mathematics that allows for encryption, decryption, and stuff like that. So people have heard of private keys. You need private keys to own your Bitcoin account to move the coins on there. So, so far, due to the strong technology built into Bitcoin since 2009, over the last 13 years, Bitcoin has not ever been hacked. So meaning, meaning here's what I mean. So if you own some Bitcoin, I don't care if it's 10 Bitcoin or even 0 0.01 Bitcoin in an account, in which you have exclusive control of those private keys, mm -hmm. no one's in the no one in the world has been able to hack it, unless your unless your private key was really easy to guess. If you create a stu a very very dumbed down private key where the the, the symbol was just zero 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 and so on, then someone can guess that. Yep. But the fidelity, meaning the complexity of the private key, is so high that no one in the right mind in the right time can hack brute force attack and break into your account. Okay. So that's never been, been done before. Yeah, yeah. But what has been done before is where centralized companies who custody Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoins and cryptocurrency, so exchanges such as Mt. Gox, uh, there's been an exchange in Japan that got hacked, exchange in Korea that got hacked, right? So all these exchanges, all these companies can get hacked, uh, either employees through, through social engineering or through uh, other sorts of Hackering, hackery stuff where they can break into a company's sort of wallet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's 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 a, that's an important distinction. Yeah. A lot of newcomers, uh, when they hear news of a site or a company getting hacked, they assume yeah. the whole Bitcoin thing is yeah. is faulty. But Bitcoin itself is not. Yeah, because we used to see those too in the earlier days when an article like that would come out and Bitcoin would get crushed. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. like, guys, it's it's not the Bitcoin. That is solid, right? So it, it did create great opportunities, though, too, for somebody who is more astute to go in and be able to buy Bitcoin at that point. Yeah. For me, that was a noise, you know, noise for a sell-off, not a signal, and so it was a great opportunity. But, That's right. But again, and I th again, things are evolving. I think people can be more sophisticated, but I think there is still a... a uh, a little bit of uneducation about that. Like they think, okay, no, somebody's hacking a Bitcoin and it's not stable. It's like, I know from my understanding, it's a fairly stable 
solid platform, right? So, yeah. yeah. And that's exactly what happened in 2014, right after yeah. the peak in the summer of 2013, where Bitcoin reached $1,200. Yeah. Uh, MT Gox, they announced their, their, they got hacked. This, I think it was in February, yeah, but, uh, January, February 2014. That's when they announced it. And that sort of kicked off the prolonged bear market yeah. that lasted two and a half years. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. Two and a half, three years almost. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's what I kind of, you know, interesting as well. It's like you've got this technology that was created for a decentralized system, right? That it, 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 it isn't a centralized location. Yet at the same time, is the biggest, I'll say, kind of companies right now that have really helped build Bitcoin are centralized, like, a, like any exchange, like a Coinbase. So you've got this amazing asset on a decentralized blockchain. Yeah. Yet it all now has to, and, and it was created to try to get around or rid of a centralized system. Yet you how right now we're all coming back to a centralized location yeah. to trade it or whatever it is. Do you see any oper Is there actually opportunities for, or are there? I mean, because I don't know. Are there actually a decentralized exchanges or anything like that that yeah. exist? So, so this is the great irony, right? You, you mentioned it. So, to clarify for the audience, so Bitcoin's whole mandate, the whole mission behind it, was to be decentralized. Yep. Yet the more popular it is, the more companies and investors want to get involved, and ultimately, a lot of these companies are ending up creating centralized yep. solutions yep. on top of Bitcoin, whether it's an exchange or a lending platform or all these uh, other other companies, right, business models. Yep. And that's the irony because they're, they're, these companies by definition are centralized because you have shareholders, you have a board of directors, you have a CEO, you have a senior management. It's a centralized organization for the purpose of trying to make money for the shareholders. And, and so on. Even nonprofits are also centralized, yep. right? So that's the irony. And the, the question was, the question is, you know, how, how does it affect the ecosystem? What, what was the question? How, how does it, uh, centralization? Yeah, I mean, I get, out? yeah, is there, is there something that's ever going to happen where it can truly exist in a decentralized ecosystem, yeah. let's call it, So right? you mentioned a decentralized exchange and so on. So it, it is a tough proposition. And let me explain uh, to... to to you and the audience, by definition, an exchange is what what people need to use to go into and out of cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. So they would use money. So in America, it would be US dollars. In Europe, it would be the euro. In Japan, it would be the Japanese yen. So for people in those countries, respectively, who want to buy into cryptocurrency or sell their cryptocurrency for money, they will have to use the exchange. So it turns out for real monetary exchanges of real money into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, you have to use a centralized exchange. And the reason is the nature of money itself. The money system that we use today, I don't care if it's the US dollar, the euro, or the Japanese yen, these are all run by the central bank, the central banking system. It's all the regular financial system. And these are centralized organizations. So you need, you need a single point of entry where people send money in via bank transfer, wire transfer, right? Or if they want to cash out, the central entity would give would send the money back to the user, right? So what what exists in the crypto industry is called de, uh, decentralized exchanges. They call uh, the nickname is DEX, decentralized exchange, the acronym. And for decentralized exchanges, they can only do exchanges between crypto and crypto. What they cannot offer is exchange between crypto and regular money. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the that's the sort of irony and, and the state of the industry today. Okay. Uh, but the closest thing we have now is people can actually exchange Bitcoin cryptocurrency with what they call stable coins. You've heard of USDT, yep. USDC. So these are cryptocurrencies backed by backed by uh, traditional money, in this case, US dollars yep. in some bank account. And the, you could do the sort of crypto to crypto on, on decentralized exchanges. But, but in the end, if you want to change it back to regular money, for your regular bank account, you'll need a centralized exchange to do that. Let me ask you this, because you, you brought that up, that I've never been able to wrap my mind around stable coins in terms of, yeah. to me, the reason I want to buy a cryptocurrency like a Bitcoin is because I want to get appreciated. I'm, I'm hoping to Investment buy- Investment potential. Exactly. That's right? exactly that, that right. I'm, I want to buy something low, and I'm hoping it's going to go up, and I'm going to be able to sell it. Yeah. Whereas you've got a stable coin, let, let's say USDC, it's pegged by the US dollar one-to-one -one ratio. It's like- so other than maybe maybe a little bit of frictionless transactions, I have no upside to it. So why Correct. why would somebody be interested in buying stable coins? Yeah, a stable coin is is uh, is inter is an intermediary interim sort of uh, 
tool. Okay. okay? So stable coins belong to the cryptocurrency family. But as I explained earlier, cryptocurrencies, actually there are many, many types of different cryptos out there with all different projects and different business models. So the subset called stable coins are actually issued by, by these organizations or companies, if you will, where they promise to have the, the fiat money reserves backing the amount of stable coins in issuance. So if you have USDC, for example, they, let's say they have $10 billion in circulation, it means that they have... $10 billion of actual U.S. dollars in their various bank accounts in the United States and whatnot under that organization. And it's generally a nonprofit organization and so on. And they would then issue $10 billion worth of USDC coins that match that and recirculate. Now, what's a benefit? If you were to buy USDC as a stable coin, you make, it, you make a perfect point. It cannot appreciate in value because by definition, it's tied to the U.S. dollar in value. So why would you do it? Well, it's for the convenience because some people may want to US, to use the stable coin version of the US dollar, USDC, for example, to then go on and purchase other cryptos where that exchange only accepts USDC, okay. but not US dollars. Okay. Okay. So what's, what's happened in the last few years is in the old days, back in the Mt. Gox days in BTC China, BTCC of my company, we would have banking relationships. We would allow users to deposit fiat money and, and withdraw fiat money. But these days, due to the increased regulation and scrutiny, many exchanges abroad, these fly-by-night, unregulated exchanges, they don't have any banking partners. They just don't. Okay. So they cannot accept your, for example, U.S. dollar bank transfer, okay. wire transfer. Okay. They can only accept USDC or USDT. In gotcha. that case, that's why you want the USDT. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. I see. So okay. it's it's a sort of interim coin. Yeah to go buy the ultimate asset you want, and whether that's other cryptos or NFTs. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Good good topic. So let's take a brief break. Okay. Um, and then we'll we'll be right back. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Dusty. Thank you. Okay. Welcome back. Hey, uh, we have Dusty Trevino here, CEO of Dot Vegas TLD. All right. Good discussion so far. Yeah, it's been a great discussion. I'm looking forward to continuing it. So <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So what what else should we talk about? So you um, you shared with me that you actually recently got into using a ballet wallets, right? I did, yeah. And that's yeah. perfect because that's one thing I want to talk to you about was a couple of things. I, yeah, so I did start nibbling a little bit on Bitcoin just because I wanted to check out the different storage methods, right? I mean, you have USB thumb drives and you've yes. got the cold storage. And I kind of got uh, introduced to your the ballet wallet the other day, and I think it's a phenomenal product. And so I bought a bought a fraction of bitcoins to load the card yeah. and kind and of where did you buy the ballet wallet where did you um, get that so actually i think it went directly to your website because okay. I, know, I know on your website you can buy it there you can go on to amazon that's right that's right okay. amazon and i think i bought it directly from you i'm pretty sure not, okay. not through amazon got it and so yeah i wanted to see that process right what does that process look like of how easy is it to yeah. actually load it onto a, a cold storage or to onto the wallet and it was a super easy process it was great and plus yeah. like I, I i i love the look of these things like these things are it, it's you did a great job with the design. It's a it's it's a great way too for somebody to see something physical. Yes. Because Bitcoin is not a physical product, right? So it's a lot of it's really hard for people to understand it. That's right. Where this is a it's a great thing to not just for security and storage of it, but just a representation of, of a physic something physical, right? That's so, right. So that's, I, that's why we named it the real series, the real Bitcoin. Okay, that's why. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah, it was great. So it was, a, it was a super easy process. I loved it. I'm looking forward to hopefully. I shouldn't say it. hopefully getting some more Bitcoin to load more on it, yeah, right? Yeah. But right now I'm just kind of testing it out. So, so you bought some Bitcoin on the dip uh, before, it, it, before it dipped? I bought such a small amount. I wasn't too worried about the dip, but, okay. but it was on the dip. I think Bitcoin was at 35, maybe 40,000 at the point. Okay. So, but again, I bought, you know, a fraction of it. So Fractions, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple hundred bucks. So it didn't really matter. And that's a beautiful thing is like, you can, you can only, you know, if you want to buy a couple hundred bucks, you can do it, right? It's not a, yeah. it's not like you have to go all in and, Spend forty thousand dollars, kind of yeah. thing, right? Did you so, buy the Bitcoin at an, on an exchange or an uh, on an ATM machine or what? So I actually did, and I, and I and I don't mean that because again, your app makes it so simple to do. But I always like to look for all scenarios and even the most difficult scenario. So I actually went to Coinbase, yes. bought it, and then I transferred it from Coinbase to the wallet yeah. here, right? So then I just I just uh, you know took yeah yeah. The, so the, so one thing I, I like you yeah I like you share with me you know uh, what what how did you find the experience of of setting up the wallet and uh, and transferring the coins from an exchange onto the Bally wallet? And, and, and even doing that was really easy to do, right? Yeah. Which is great. So it was a simple, easy way to do. 
<laughs> then my problem is I, every like five minutes I'm like scanning the app on, uh, you know, or scan yeah. that and look at the app to see what the price is. Right. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. It's, and it's there and everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so again, it, it was a really easy process to do. Okay, so good, it was, good. It, it I'm was glad great. you found it easy. Yeah, it was a great experience. We, we, um, I, we invented this wallet, uh, three years ago, launching ballet. Okay. And one of the key differences be- of this hardware cold storage wallet compared to all the other ones in industry is this one requires no setup. So it's really easy to use for regular people. So you don't have to have a PhD in computer science or any degrees in cryptography and blockchain. You can literally buy this, you know, from ballycrypto.com website or from Amazon. And uh, when you open it, you you get to use it right away. Just like Dusty just said you found. I'm very happy to hear this uh, genuine feedback from you. No, it was great. It was great. So, um, yeah, I was going to... Yeah. And is that is that... Is that the case with kind of all the let's call it a cold storage wallet or whatever, where you've got you've got the wallet passphrase and you've got the private keys? Is that it's uh, it's our solution to it. Okay. So this is actually an industry compliant industry standard. It's called BIP thirty eight. That's the name of the standard. It's, okay. It's a Bitcoin standard. that has been around for nine and a half years, coming up ten years now. Okay. And uh, it allows um, it allows us to create this wallet where there's no setup process for you. Okay. Okay. And then the way to unlock it wallet is once you buy it, by the way, you have full exclusive control of your private yep. key. Yep. So this is what, what we mean by self-custody. Yeah, don't right? lose this. <laughs> don't lose this. That's that's your wallet. Yep. We call it the real Bitcoin because once you put Bitcoin in here, yep. it's got real Bitcoin. It's a physical instantiation yep. of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in your hand. You can, as long as you don't lose it from your hand, okay. you're not gonna lose you're not gonna get hacked, you're not gonna lose the funds. Yep. No one else has control of it. No one can seize your funds. No one can stop payment. No one can take it away. Uh, no one can even see your balance. You have full privacy okay. as long as you keep the private, keep the QR code private to yourself and don't let anyone see it. Okay. And the way it works is there's actually two temporary evident pieces on here. There's okay. the sticker, the QR code. <laughs> she's actually a sticker. If you peel it back, it's a temporary evident sticker. There's another smaller QR code in yellow behind this one. Okay. And then on the strip here, you just use a coin to gently scratch it off, and there's a string of numbers and letters, and that's a passphrase. So the two together will allow you to create your own private key, and that allows you to unlock the funds for your wallet. Okay. And that's how the ballet wallet works. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, the hope is, like I said, fund these, put them in the safe, and forget about it for that's 30 exactly. years, right? And yeah, then, and <laughs> that's 30 years, absolutely. In and fact, then, we we think we've, decide, we've designed the world's sort of longest-lasting wallet, this we've designed it with twenty year lifetime in mind, and most likely it'll hold for thirty years as well. But probably there's no other hardware cold storage wallet out there that has a de- this design time span of, of twenty years. Because yeah. that's one of that, I guess that was always one of my concerns with you know let's call it a thumb drive or the USB sticks. It's yeah, like, yeah. Well, I mean, I I. I I mean, again, because I'm not very sophisticated, I'm like, well, in 20 years from now, what if, can that get corrupted, right? Or what if a magnet gets run by it and it gets corrupted? Exactly. Right? Where this, it doesn't seem like that's possible at all. It's like, yeah. you know, like, again, more than likely, 99.9% chance that in 30 years, it's still good, right? Yeah, Unlike exactly. a thumb drive where it's like maybe 50-50. Yeah, right? exactly. Or, or like, even less. Or right? even yeah. less, right? Yeah. So that's why yeah. I, I did, I, I really loved just not even the look and the feel and having something physical, but just... It feels safer to me to have it on this, yeah, right? It's, uh, in order to put it in my safe. And not electronic, no, no electronic part, just stainless steel. Yep. Yeah, no, it's, a, yeah, yeah. it's got great weight to it, man. I love the weight of it, yeah, too. It it's feels, kind of hefty, right? Yeah, it is very yeah. hefty. I love it. Yeah, we, we made it nice and thick. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. So so what else? So I know you had some questions uh, about Bitcoin itself, right? Yeah, when the, there was one other question, again, that I've, I've been wanting to ask somebody like yourself because again, it's no, another one you see in the media quite a bit. Yeah. Um. And and so it's all really hard to tell where the truth is per se. That's right. And and that's the energy consumption that they always talk about that it takes to mine Bitcoin and how much it is. Right. And where they're saying it's more than some countries consume. Right. An entire country. Yes. Can you kind of put that in perspective for me? Like, is that accurate? And or just for the average person, is do how much consumption does it? take to mine Bitcoin. Yeah, so I don't have the latest figures, but okay. Bitcoin, so it turns out mining Bitcoin is a global phenomenon. So yep. there are a lot of uh, companies, a lot of individuals, a lot of even governments get into mining. And Bitcoin mining, you, you everyone's fighting for the new issuance of Bitcoin. So these days, you know how Bitcoin is limited to 21 million? Yep. But what's happening is the 21 million gets sent out into the world slowly over time. In the beginning, it was quite fast. Now it's slower and slower and slower. So it's going to still last 100 years, but today we're only getting about 900 Bitcoins per day into the world okay. of new Bitcoins. And everyone in the world who's mining for Bitcoin are fighting for a share 
of the 900 bitcoins and then within two years that amount is going to fall to 450 and 225 it'll keep going down in half every every four years so that's why it's taking a lot of energy for the people to mine bitcoin but but the other truth is um the reality is many industries require a lot of energy as well so whether it's mining gold mining aluminum right whether it's uh creating steel you know, drilling for oil yep. so a lot of those industries also take up a lot of energy mm -hmm. you know lots of energy right including if you think about this direct energy used by the machinery that's used to you know mine diamonds and gold and drill for oil uh, and also to refine steel and then there's indirect energy which is the personnel involved the making of the machines and uh, the personnel involved the labor and the you know the people who you're hiring to do all the labor they have to go home they have to you know use electricity and so on and so forth so so it's it's hard to do a fair comparison whether the Bitcoin industry is more energy con, uh, consuming than any of the other sort of natural resources industries out there. And there's also non-natural resources like making airplanes and making cars, how much energy is involved. Yeah. But in the end, it's all market balance, right? If people, if we, if we believe in free capitalism, if people want to choose to spend their money, quote unquote, to, to, to spend on energy to do X, Y, Z, Thing, then that's that's what you should do right and yeah. governments can obviously regulate so my point is obviously i want a greener earth i want sustainable energy but the way to do that is to regulate at the source and not to regulate the consumption of it so it's it's in, in other words the argument is if people want to hang Chris, hang christmas lights on their home for the whole christmas holiday season that uses a lot of electricity yep. and to the person who's hanging it on their home they like it they enjoy it they like their house lit up but to someone else, hey, that's that's a that's a bad use of electricity, right? So how do you how do you judge, right? Whether using, you know, is it is it better for you to dry your clothes in the in a laundry dryer machine, or is it better to just hang it out and let it air dry out in your backyard, right? So it's it's really a question of you know, do you have the right to use the energy you want? So I suggest rather than fight that battle, which is a lot of opinions and a lot of um, you know finger pointing yep we should really regulate the energy product uh, the energy production so get rid of fossil fuel and energy production go to solar go to renewable sources like geothermal yep. like wind yep. and then when all the energy is created in a renewable fashion then it doesn't matter if you're using it for bitcoin or christmas lights or you know drying your clothes yep. no and, and i and i agree i think it's been an unfair characteristic or or categorization of the bitcoin energy use when it's like like you just said it's like well you look at all the other industries that use energy that i'm sure use just as much if not more um it's it's just again it's kind of unfair but it's it's for some reason they wanted to attack it for that right yeah yeah it, it seems some it, haters it, out there it, yeah it definitely seemed unfair for me as well again i think it is going to i think it is going to drive some innovation in alternative energies and even like what those kids are doing in texas where they're using the flaring now from that uh, natural gas fields now to to to, to generate power to, to mine bitcoin right so you're taking something that was just going in the atmosphere exactly now they're actually using that yeah. that, that flared natural gas uh, as an energy source to mine Bitcoin is a phenomenal idea. So, and I, I think you would maybe you see some more oil gas companies get behind that too. Yeah, don't so. let that go to waste. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Even though right. it's bad already. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, because it, it was being wasted anyways. At least now you're 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 taking that and producing something with it. I.e., sure. mining. So I think it was a great sure. idea. But anyways, good, so. good. So I think time's up. We okay. have a, this is a great episode. Yeah. Thank you, Dusty, for joining us. Right. Thank joining you, Bobby. Me. Appreciate yeah. the time, man. Very nice to meet you too, and I appreciate this. Yes. So again, this is Bobby Lee Bitcoin. And my uh, our, our podcast series, Bobby Lee Bitcoin's podcast. Thank you, Dusty. Thank you. Okay, bye bye, everyone. Signing off. <laughs>